In this segment, we're going to consider how oh, that sounds terrible. It's down here. In this segment, we're going to consider how uh, Kripke's approach to modality fits into this picture. Now, I want to be very clear up front. The reason we're considering how Kripke's approach to modality works into this picture uh, isn't because I think Kripke solves this problem. It's rather because, one, some people historically did think Kripke solved this problem, and uh, two, sociologically, that that was an influential point of view. So here's the rough idea, very rough, and then we'll go through. Some people thought like this. Kripke thinks that certain necessary truths are not knowable a priori. They're only knowable a posteriori. Therefore, the idea goes, perception is telling you those necessary truths. Well, if perception is telling you those necessary truths, then there's no problem with a realist modal ontology. So we have a good fit between our ontology and epistemology, and we can have the realism that we want. I don't think that that view is correct. I don't think it holds up, but historically, uh, some people sort of thought that way. I don't think Kripke himself thought that way, but others did. Okay, so uh, what is Kripke's modal epistemology? Well, first, to be clear, he adopts a realist modal ontology. There's no question about that. So what is the modal epistemology? Is it intuition, like everybody else ad advances, or is it perception, perceptual experience? By experience here, I just mean perceptual experience or perception. Um, let's think about what Kripke actually does. So he imagines scenarios, like he says, I want you to imagine that uh, Gödel, the guy we know as Kurt Gödel, actually stole the proof for Gödel's incompleteness theorem from some other guy named Schmidt. Or imagine that uh, you know uh, Jonah wasn't swallowed by a whale, or whatever it is he asks you to imagine. Imagine that tigers all have three legs, or tigers are robots. Or uh, imagine that uh, light is made of sound waves. So he imagines some scenario, where a scenario is the way the actual world is. So he says, imagine the actual world is a certain way. And he then determines what his expressions refer to in those scenarios by checking his intuitions. He's very clear about this. So he says things like, well, if Gödel in fact stole the proof from Schmidt, Intuitively, the name Gödel still refers to Gödel. It doesn't refer to Schmidt just because Schmidt is the actual discoverer of the relevant theorem. So he consults his intuition and uh, intuitions about reference, about how his terms refer, and takes them at face value. He also imagines other possible worlds and checks his intuitions about what his expressions refer to in those other possible worlds, given how they refer in the actual world. Now, you may remember at the very beginning, I said that metaphysical possibility is possibility given how things actually are, and metaphysical necessity is necessity given how things actually are. Um, here, we're going to introduce this idea of given how things actually are. So let me give you an example, and we'll go into this example in much more detail in the next slideshow, but um, in this segment, we're just going to uh, do this very briefly. So take some standard a posteriori necessity like uh, water is identical with H2O. According to Kripke, this is a necessary truth. Um, it's true in all possible worlds. And nonetheless, it's not knowable a priori. Well, it seems pretty clear that it's not knowable a priori. Just by reflecting on your concept of water, you can't know anything about H2O. If you could, then anyone who was competent with the expression water or had the concept of water, as, say, the ancient Greeks did, would have been able to, just by conceptual analysis, discover atomic theory, discover chemistry, discover that there is hydrogen and oxygen, and how they bind, and so on and so forth. Well, that's impossible. You can't discover uh, hydrogen and oxygen just by reflecting on your concept water. Otherwise, we would have made that discovery ages ago. So it follows that it's not knowable a priori that water is H2O. Well, says Kripke, Nonetheless, when we use the term water, we're just referring to H2O. So water is necessarily H2O. That is, water is H2O in all possible worlds. But notice for Kripke, this water is H2O in all possible worlds conclusion is conditional on water being H2O in the actual world. 
So he says, in the actual world, we discover that the samples that we've been calling water are in fact samples of H2O. That's an empirical discovery, something we discover through perception. Only with that fact about the actual world in place can we then conclude that it's necessary that water is H2O, that is, that water is H2O in all possible worlds. From the epistemic point of view, we could discover tomorrow that the actual samples of water aren't samples of H2O. Maybe we reject atomic theory, maybe we reject chemical theory altogether, and we substitute some new theory on which water is, uh, samples of water are samples of some other substance which explains their uh, macroscopic behaviors, like XYZ. So we discover that samples of water are samples of XYZ in the actual world. Then, given that water is XYZ in the actual world, we can conclude that it's necessary that water is XYZ and thus is XYZ in all possible worlds. Um, now, again, we're going to go into this in much more detail later. Right now, I just want you to see that in Kripke's methodology, he sometimes imagines other possible worlds and says, what do my terms refer to in those possible worlds, given how things actually are? And that phrase, given how things actually are, sometimes matters. Because if, given that water, well, I'll put it this way, given that water, samples of water are samples of H2O, when I think about other possible worlds, I should say that every sample of H2O is a sample of water, and anything that's a not a sample of H2O isn't a sample of water. But given that samples of water aren't samples of H2O, but instead are samples of some other substance, XYZ, then when I think about other possible worlds, I should say that the samples of XYZ are the water. Okay, since experience plays a role in telling us which world is actual, whether samples of water are actually samples of H2O or instead are actually samples of XYZ, for example, uh, experience plays a role for Kripke in deciding what expressions refer to in other possible worlds. And that, that role for experience is what made people mistakenly think that Kripke adopts a perception-based modal epistemology. But here's what's crucial. Intuition is also playing a role. Yes, perception tells us that samples of water are samples of H2O, but they don't, perception does not tell us that water is necessarily H2O. Rather, intuition tells us that given that samples of water are samples of H2O, then water is necessarily H2O. So intuition is still playing a crucial role. Um, Kripke, of course, takes claims about reference to establish corresponding claims about necessity, essence, and possibility slash accident. Why is that? Well, if your term water refers to H2O in all possible worlds and only H2O in all possible worlds, then water is necessarily H2O. So the claim about necessity falls out of the claim about reference. If in some possible world your term water doesn't refer to H2O, then water isn't necessarily H2O. Put another way, water is possibly something other than H2O. So what's crucial here is that both experience and intuition play a role in Kripke's modal epistemology. So where does this leave Kripke's approach in our schema? Does he gain the advantage of fit by having perception play a role in telling us about real necessities and possibilities? Or is he in the same boat as traditional rationalists, as far as the fit goes, since intuition still plays a significant role in assessing modal claims? I'm just going to assert that it's the latter. The idea is uh, the genuinely modal knowledge, the, genuinely no the knowledge that's genuinely knowledge of necessity and possibility, is coming from intuition. Empirical discoveries are telling you things like, oh, samples of water are samples of H2O. But that isn't yet a modal claim in an irrelevant sense. And insofar as it is, it's not really experience that's giving it to you. So uh, it's only when you insert the, it, it, sorry, it's only when you make use of intuition or some other a prioristic mode of inference or kind of evidence that you can get to claims about necessity and possibility. So it's really intuition that's doing the heavy lifting in producing modal knowledge, so the fit between the ontology and the epistemology uh, is no better than it was for the rationalist. Okay. All right, so here's our options on the table, and what I want to suggest here is that Kripke's view is a rationalist view, just like traditional rationalism with a little modification. And when I say just like traditional rationalism, what I mean is it has the same disadvantage as traditional rationalism, the same poor fit between its ontology and epistemology. Okay, um, so that's our introduction to traditional approaches to modality and how Kripke relates to them. In the next segment, we'll go into detail about how Kripke thinks about uh, 
modality. That is how he thinks about necessity and possibility, and uh, we'll talk a bit about how he thinks about modal epistemology as well.